patriotism, faith, national unity, education, fiscal responsibility, civility, the values that define America. Fascinating stories and talks from America-loving patriots dedicated to preserving freedom, opportunity, and justice. Welcome to the Friends and Fellow Citizens Podcast. Hello, everyone, and welcome to episode 91 of Friends and Fellow Citizens. I'm your host, Sherman Tylowski. Thank you all so much for joining me for this week's episode. If you haven't already, make sure to subscribe to Friends and Fellow Citizens to get the latest notifications about new episodes, new content. Got a lot of really interesting things coming up this summer and later in 2022, so be sure to stay tuned. You can also check out our email subscription as well. Go to shermantyloski.com. Link down in the show notes below to subscribe to our email list so you can get the latest notifications about new episodes right to your inbox. This episode will be focused on our next gentleman, a next signer in our Sacred Honor series. And the gentleman's name for this episode is William Williams. And yes, that is his real name. <laughs> Not the most original, clearly. Uh, I believe his great-great-grandfather's name was Robert Williams. So I was thinking, well, maybe he had some kind of nickname where they could, they could have just gone with a previous uh, relative and have it at least a bit of a different sounding name. But uh, I I certainly was not there to name him. So there, there you go. That's his, name, his name was William Williams. Um, he is our next signer from the state of Connecticut. Or I should have said what would have been the state of Connecticut later after the signing of the Declaration of Independence. Uh, William Williams is a, a man who well, was born in Lebanon, Connecticut on April 18th, 1731. He was very much interested in religion. He loved to study theology, loved to study the Bible. Uh, we'll get a little bit more into the religion element later in the episode. Uh, but he got himself involved in local politics, just like a lot of the other signers. He was part of a militia group from, during the French and Indian Wars, he was also one to get himself into the mercantile business as well. He was part of that group that really tried to understand how business operates. He wanted to start something his own. He wanted to gain that experience, really making those connections. Well, he certainly made a lot of good connections. One of them really, really paid off uh, at the age of almost 40 uh, in 1771, Williams married a young woman who was 25 at the time. Her name was Mary Trumbull. And what was particularly lucky about uh, Mr. Williams here is that Mary was the daughter of the royal governor of Connecticut, Jonathan Trumbull. So when you have a father-in-law who's essentially the only royal governor in the colonies who side with the Patriot cause, and you happen to be one very, very interested in politics and of the Patriot cause, you probably know a lot about this man. <laughs> you probably had a lot of coffees and a lot of meals with him. And that really was the case with uh, Jonathan Trumbull, governor. I'll just call him Governor Trumbull from now on. Uh, but not to, to mix it up with another Trumbull. Have you ever heard of the uh, painting or seen the painting of the Committee of Five presenting the Declaration of Independence, that giant painting in the Capitol Tunnel, there's some other works of art by the same artist. That was done by John Trumbull. And John Trumbull is a brother of Mary Williams. You can imagine how many connections Williams got when he married this one woman. He got, I think, he got incredibly fortunate. And he really used this to the benefit of his family and ultimately the, and the cause of the American Revolution. Williams was a fervent supporter of the Sons of Liberty. He was known to be a very calm person most of the time, but there are certain accounts that said that he would would be a very, very, very vocal person, so to speak, using a lot of very strong language. Uh, at least for the most part, he was calm. So that's the most important part. Uh, one example of this, this outburst, if you like, I guess I don't know how often this outburst would come about for Mr. Williams, uh, but he was one to know how to write. 
And he certainly played a very, very important role for his father-in-law, Governor Trumbull, in writing a lot of papers for him during the American Revolutionary Times. I'll give you an example of, of a piece of work that Williams got himself into on, on July 1st, 1774. And this was, just to give you some idea of what was happening, there was something called the Coercive Acts, which were, as you can imagine with the name, were very, very punitive punishments on Boston, in particular because of the Boston Tea Party that happened just about seven months before. Just a lot of tension, a lot of hatred from the UK, from England, against really just this this tiny city of Boston here. And Williams was super, super upset. And he's not a Massachusetts native, but you know, come from neighboring Connecticut, he's like, well, what, what happens if this whole movement starts coming in here? And he writes in the Connecticut Gazette, and he publishes something called To the King from America, which I thought was very interesting because I wonder how many people were really thinking of that using that name of America when the Declaration of Independence hadn't even been adopted and signed. But in this document, it was a satirical document. And here's a quote that is cited. I mean, if you find it on Wikipedia, you can find other sources here, but it's, it's just fabulous, fabulous writing. Here's what he writes. He writes, quote, We don't complain that your father made our yoke heavy and afflicted us with grievous service. We only ask that you would govern us upon the same constitutional plan and with the same justice and moderation that he did, and we will serve you forever. And what is the language of your answer? Speaking to George III, clearly. He continues, Your rebels and traitors, if you don't yield implicit obedience to all my commands, just and unjust, you shall be dragged in chains across the wide ocean to answer your insolence. And if a mob arises among you to impede my officers in the execution of my orders, I will punish and involve in common ruin whole cities and colonies with their 10,000 innocents and you shan't be heard in your own defense, but shall be murdered and butchered by my dragoons into silence and submission. You reptiles, you are scarce entitled to existence any longer. Your lives, liberties, and property are all at the absolute disposal of my parliament, unquote. Now, now this is obviously very dramatic coming from Mr. Williams here, but there's a lot of good points here. One is that there were these laws and these policies that would essentially stifle anyone who was accused of saying something bad against the king. Now, clearly in this example, this is one of them. Uh, but in a lot of these things, like, for example, the idea that you were to be dragged and changed across the wide ocean, how, however number of times that actually happened is, is another subject – but there were a number of times, in fact, it was outlined in the Declaration of Independence, uh, that when, a lot of times you would have a case of some kind against someone who descended against the king. And what the royal government would say was like, okay, all right, all right by the way, tomorrow the trial will be, you know, let's just say you were living in Boston. They might say something like, all right, well, the trial is going to be in Richmond uh, tomorrow. But then you think, well, what? I can't, I can't even get there in one day. And certainly, I mean, perhaps certainly nowadays, that would be a lot different as we can now fly with airplanes. But at that time, they would the royal government would literally cite or say that by you need to show up to court on this and the next day or in a few days. And oh, by the way, it's on the other side of the country. And if because you literally physically could not make it, they would essentially punish you, and and they just get away with it. And that's how that's how crazy it was with the judicial system and the way that a lot of colonists were treated at the time. So one of the many many grievances in the outline of the Declaration. Um, anyway, I just want to bring up this this little quote here from the <laughs> the satirical document that Williams was a part of. It, it really shows a, a couple things ideas or a couple things about. William Williams. Williams was very, very driven with a very, very passionate and spirited about the independence cause. But he also was someone who was able to restrain himself and be someone whom people could depend on. One example is the fact that he got into this the local politics and was able to defend his record, be able to 
be someone relatable to his constituents. He was a town clerk for many years. I believe it was from 1752 to 1796. Imagine that kind of a role for 40 plus years as a town clerk. Served as a, a Connecticut assemblyman for 45 years. Uh, just a, a very, very long record in politics. He clearly was able to take his record, be able to connect with people, not just within Connecticut, but with other signers and other delegates too. This all really contributed to him being such a, a powerful figure in Connecticut politics, eventually leading up to what would be a lot of the foundation for the Connecticut state government. Williams himself was very involved in the money area of supporting the revolution. He oftentimes used his own money to pay for militias or for ammunition and equipment. Reminds me a little bit about John Hancock. As you might recall from the first episode of the series, John Hancock was a very, very wealthy merchant and was oftentimes seen as the big financial supporter for the uh, independence cause. Williams was kind of like that. He wasn't as high profile, but he was able to, in a number of cases, be able to just pull out some money in the last minute to fund for a Connecticut militia and to be able to fight off British forces. That that was the kind of gentleman uh, Williams was. Very, very influential. Clearly was able to show that, that he was a very, very, very fervent supporter of the independence movement. Williams plays another very important role in the American Revolution, not solely because he was able to fund for militias and for ammunition, but he served as a liaison between the royal governor, Governor Trumbull, his father-in-law, and the Continental Congress. Why this is important is because the American Revolutionary War was so much on logistics. And in fact, pretty much almost any war you can think of has to deal with logistics. You think of that famous quote from General Pershing about how uh, about infantry win battles, logistics wins wars. I would say that that concept very much applies to why Governor Trumbull is so important, why therefore William Williams was very, very important in this cause. In fact, there's a huge treasure trove of correspondence between Governor Trumbull and George Washington. And while the content itself is not particularly interesting in the sense that it could really manifest itself into a whole podcast episode, but I was able to find a passage that deviates a little bit from the logistical side of things and goes into how Governor Trumbull himself felt. And I, I do think that it reflects a lot of what William Williams felt, too, because, like I said, they worked very closely together. Williams helped out a lot with the correspondence. Washington himself had some help with correspondence, too, but this is uh, com coming from, uh, from Jonathan Trumbull, Governor Trumbull, to writing to George Washington. Quote, The spirits and ardor of our people are not subdued or abated. Men who have tasted of freedom and who have felt their personal rights, are not easily taught to bear with encroachments on either, and cannot, without great preparation, be brought to submit to oppression. The admiration of riches leads to despotical government. Amar Celeratus Habendi, at this time, greatly endangers these states, from one of consideration that, if the public is not saved, their personal interests and pursuits must be lost. Now, if you're probably like me, you probably heard that Latin phrase and sort of like habit what? <laughs> uh, it, it's called Amor Celeratus Habendi. This is a Latin phrase from John Locke, and it's referring to the fact that the selfishness of people with regards to material wealth is effectively a very, very bad, bad part of society, and that it it really requires some way to be able to mitigate something like this. And it says that the it's not really about the greed of people who produce a lot of things, but it's really about the the people who get into power and go after the 
I don't know, the wealth of the people. And what needs to happen is that the public needs to hold these people accountable and be able to stop them from seizing wealth. I think this is a really, really interesting topic. I mean, you can make all kinds of connections with this little passage, but this this Latin phrase and thing really encapsulates what the struggle was. There were a number of wealthy people at the time, certainly on the patriot side of things, but the the overall force that was uniting a lot of these people together, both wealthy and poor, was the realization that no matter who you were, the people who were not representing you, who are in power, aka what the most of the royal governors, George III, the British Parliament, those were the people who were essentially taking your wealth without any kind of consent, without any sort of accountability, without any elections. This was the the issue that was really binding a lot of people together. So this is a very very big deal. This idea that. It wasn't really because of just the people who were producing a lot. It was the, the fact that people were seizing wealth no matter where they where it was amongst their uh, subjects, or at least the people who who should be the ones in control of their country. The people should be ruling, not the ruling class. Just to finish out the quote here, it says, Effectually, to guard the safety of the people, great care is needed needful to preserve their virtue. Virtue is true bliss. Tis the great object of all good government. We will persevere in its pursuit. The Lord reigneth. Let us rejoice therein. He sets one thing over against another that we may find nothing after him. I'll stop there for that quote from Governor Trumbull. You know, this really ties in a lot with Williams himself because, as I said earlier, he was a very religious man. He was someone who was very curious about the human condition, but really a lot about why people are attached to material wealth and and how to really get away from that. This is part of this idea of religion, be able to find a higher authority over people and something that is is a whole issue in itself. We'll, We'll get to that at the end of this episode. I really like this passage a lot, especially the quote, virtue is true bliss. I mean, think about, and virtue meaning high moral standards, Think about how many times we've seen in our society when people really have just completely, seems like they've completely lost their virtue, have gone straight to material wealth. What has that led to? It's led to destruction. It's led to people being greedy. It's led to a breakdown in society of people knowing what the difference is between right and wrong. We've seen a lot, of, it comes through all different forms, but I do think that given the the state of affairs and given the fact that here in this passage we we are talking about p- protecting people's virtue protecting people's morality and standards if one doesn't have virtue in a society th- that society has nothing and this is a very very ingrained idea that i, I really hope that can be resurrected i it, i think it's ingrained in many ways in American history, um, through the people who have come and gone, the people who have served their nation, regardless of the uh, challenges, the success, we have successes and challenges just like any other country. But the the ability to preserve that virtue um, in a society is, is priceless, and no one else can take that away. Just a great passage. Now let's move on to Williams himself. Now, Williams, through his contributions with Governor Trumbull, again, very, very involved in those militias. I mean, he, I, I mentioned the treasure trove. It really is a lot of technical information about generals, about who's this, who, where the troops are, how much money is being loaned. It's a whole, a whole tre- I think it's a great it's a great tra- trove, especially for accountants and anyone who wants to track money and anyone is involved in logistics or transcom or any other agency or organization that deals with this subject. And it's a, just a fascinating read. Now, Williams himself initially was not part of that original Connecticut delegation, but because of various duties that had to be changed, uh, Wolcott, another representative, he had to leave for, for other reasons. Uh, but 
uh, Williams was uh, was uh, selected to go to the signing of the Declaration of Independence. Now, he he could not vote for it, though. He arrived quite a bit late. He arrived at the end of the July. And so he, he didn't have a chance to vote for it, but he was able to show up and be able to be the, become the 12th signer of the Declaration of Independence. Williams uh, continues on to be one very influential in Connecticut politics. Like I said, going back to his religion, he was very much influential in the adoption of the Constitution in Connecticut. Unfortunately, there was quite a bit of pushback. There were just a number of people who didn't like the concept or the framework of the Constitution. One thing that Williams did not like about the Constitution was that it did not include a clause that allowed religious tests. He was very much in favor of religious tests, mainly because he felt that you need some kind of religion and some kind of a set of religious beliefs that he felt that had to be scrutinized, that had to be looked at by the people and by the people who were selecting uh, elected representatives. Even though he didn't like the fact that the Constitution did not have this clause, he really wanted to put it in there, but he felt that the direction of the country needed some kind of national unity, and that's why he voted for it. He didn't, just like a lot of other people, there were probably a bunch of other things that other people didn't like about the Constitution, but he felt that it was necessary to put the national interest first, and that's why he helped with the ratification of the Constitution in Connecticut. Williams would go much deeper into his own studies about religion. Um, he would serve in various different capacities throughout. Again, he was very, very active in local politics. Uh, he actually was able to outlive a lot of his fellow delegates. He uh, passes away in 1811 at the age of 80. Quite a bit to unpack here, and, and I I think there's a number of things that one could take, but the first thing I would say in terms of the takeaway from William Williams, this 12th signer of the Declaration of Independence, the first is I really it's important for people to back up their own beliefs with actions. And it sounds very simple, but I, I can't tell you how many times I've seen people who retweet something or who post a, a flag or a saying on a profile picture and claim that this is something that they're doing, that they're helping with a big cause. I'm not saying that every single person maybe necessarily has the time and willpower to be a council member or be a member of you know, the of the Congress. But it's really, it's very important that in any situation or in, no matter what what someone's own political beliefs are. People are going to see your actions. What are what exactly is someone doing if they say that they support X and Y? And Williams really showed that himself. You know, someone who I mean, he clearly had the financial means to help with paying for a militia or for equipment or ammunition, but he could have just been that gentleman who would say, "Well, you know what." I, you know, I support the revolution, yada, yada, yada. That's, that's what I think. And that's my contribution. He, he probably could have done that. He, he still would have been very wealthy, still could have gone, lived a very great life. But the fact that he was literally going house to house to help fund for a militia group, not that he necessarily had to do that, but he, he decided to do that because he wanted to show that he himself could help support the revolutionary cause. He was going to be the one to take action. He was going to be the one to go door to door, talk to people, ask them what they think, what they want, maybe what they want changes in in exchange for their support. Maybe he would have gone back to the Continental Congress and say, look, we got to change the way we do things. We got people who are saying this, saying that, they don't like this, they don't like this. That's but that's about taking action. It's not just saying that I support the American Revolution and that's it, and all of a sudden George the Third is going to be defeated. It's all about it's about all that. I would also include the logistics element to it. Like I said earlier with Governor Trumbull, all those course all those letters, correspondence and all while while again, it's not maybe podcast worthy, but all of those all those letters including the work of William Williams as 
as a liaison working on all these committees as well in the Continental Congress. All this really put together and made the American Revolution tangible. People could feel those victories with those victories on the battlefield against General Howe. They could feel it with the pressure that they're putting on on customs officials who refuse to um, to, to negotiate or work with people. They essentially were putting out fines or seizing cargo or something. There, there's there's all these different elements of of governance and of also negotiations. Think about foreign negotiations with the French, the work of Ben Franklin and and all those who worked even with Spain and with uh, and with other other players and it's it's a very very interesting political operation that had to come down to how good were the logistics and i would argue that the british had a lot of trouble with logistics and one of the big reasons why they lost is because they didn't have that same sort of robust structure of logistics it wasn't perfect governor trumbull i believe even in that passage kind of was referring to some of those some of those people in those states or in the, those colonies getting that money and spending on something that shouldn't be spent on, uh, he, he probably was not very happy with that, and you, <laughs> neither was George Washington. Uh, but it, this required a realization that you need to be able to put the money and the actions where one mouth, one's mouth is. And that's exactly what happened with Willow Williams and with other people as well. Number two... I would say it's it's very important to put something bigger like national unity or an interest first over one's own individual difference or differences. This is really in reference to William's support for the Constitution. As a religious man, and I mean, when I say religious, I mean he was really religious, you know, like re- very, very dedicated, very, very faithful. He also understood that if we don't get some kind of unity over a constitution. We're not going to have a constitution. He understood this. Other signers that we've covered have also felt this way too. And this is something that we've, I think we've very much lost in our society now is that we, we, we become very my way or the highway. And that's not going to be good for consensus. It's not good for people to be able to build relationships. I mean, what in what world... Am I going to be able to agree with every single little thing with a family member or friend? It's not realistic. And if we can't even get past that realism, we are in a a lot of trouble as a society. Uh, I believe our elected officials and they need to reflect that spirit and be able to reflect that ability to work with people from different sides of the aisle. Not all the time, and uh, certainly it's not an easy task, but it really starts with with that message of saying, look, I know that I am not going to be right all the time. If we start at least start from a position of being humble, then I think we can get to a better position in our politics today. The last takeaway I would say is something that is just sorely needed in our society today, and that is we need to bring back religion and the role of religious principles in our politics today. What I've seen over the past several years, and it's probably gone on for much longer than this, but I've seen too often people trying to explain away issues about how someone is doing with psychology, psychiatry, instead of religion. The fact that there are people who are not necessarily medically uh, having a problem. I mean, it's one thing to have a medical problem using medicine and to be able to use certain treatments to be able to help someone. That's one issue of being sick, of being ill. But the other element, I believe, is the well-being of someone. The fact that there's people who who don't have a direction. They don't, they don't know what the meaning of life is. And I don't want to get too philosophical here, but we've, we've often so frequently try to replace religion with science. And that is a horrible, horrible danger in our society today. I was speaking to my, my parents, and we, I decided to look up how many psychologists there are in the United States. You won't believe how many. An estimate here, according to this article, this was from 2014, so it's probably higher. 100 
and 6,500 psychologists possess current licenses in the United States. Just almost 18,000 in California. I, I can't believe that huge number. First of all, I'm, I'm not saying that we shouldn't have advances in psychology. On these podcasts, we speak a lot about cognitive dissonance, about, con- about cognitive biases. These are concepts in psychology, and they're very, very helpful in understanding why people behave the way they do. So it's not about against the science or against psychology as a field. It's the fact that I, I truly feel that there's too many people turn to the wrong people. What I think so happens so frequently is that someone who doesn't have a direction in life goes to a psychiatrist and the psychiatrist is something along the lines of, well, you just got to take this pill, you got to do these exercises, whatever, you'll be good to go. First of all, that's a scam because that doesn't help the actual source of the problem. But second of all, it just doesn't go to the source of the uh, the issue, which is pe- there are people who, they don't need another pill. They don't need another therapy session. They need direction. They need guidance. They need virtue. To be able to live up to those things, no one can take away from you. But we are not doing our job as a society to express the value of virtue. There is absolutely no amount of medicine or medications or pills or therapies that can change someone's life for the better. I do not believe that. I believe that you need to take medicine clearly if you are ill. But if someone is wanting to look for meaning and they want to build a life that serves others, they want to show that they love others, or they want to make a difference in their community, why not give them the most priceless element in their soul, which is virtue and care, bring out that their ability to be good. We really have drifted away from that in our society. And I hope that even though I don't see personally a religious test being feasible in our current, in our current conditions nowadays, but maybe we don't need them. Maybe that'll be inherent within people. People will start to realize the value of of bringing back moral authority again. When we try to, there's been so many instances where we've tried, in, in based in the past or even to this day, of people trying to replace moral authority with with humans, never works. Never works out. Look at communist regimes. The fact that communist regimes got rid of all elements of religion, uh, got rid of all principles. I think is evidence that that is not a society that works. And look at look at how look at how many people suffer under these regimes. I believe that you need to have the ability to have freedom of religion, to be able to in- include the values of goodness amongst people. I think you can do that in a modern society. I believe William Williams is telling us some, something about his call for a religious test. It's not to say that if you were just because you're a particular denomination that you should be excluded. It's the fact that we need to be expecting better of our leaders. And part of that, I think, needs to be part, ingrained within our society as a whole. We need to start voting for people who have good convictions and who have good values, not settling for uh, people who can pass on as someone who could bring money to the district or bring money to the state. That's not someone worth voting for. If we can do that part to vote for people who have strong principles, maybe not necessarily people who agree with us all the time, but maybe people who can do a good job, you know, that I think is is part of the fabric we can have in our civics. I'm hopeful that our society is going to be in a better place. I don't think I've seen the inflection yet of people deviating back towards religious values and principles, but I, I think it's coming. I think it's going to be coming before you know it. But if we can harbor these values, be able to select those good people who are not perfect, but who can bring back some faith in our d- democracy and our institutions again, I know that we will have a civic fabric that is strong, that is resilient, and that can really reflect back those amazing democratic values that we hold so dear every single day. 
And with that, thank you so much for listening to episode 91. I hope you enjoyed it. Make sure to subscribe to our show if you haven't already. Enjoy the rest of your week. And remember, a day in America is always better when we are with our friends and fellow citizens.